On July 7, 1914, the Boston Braves used an off day to play an exhibition game against the minor league Buffalo Bisons. They were embarrassed, losing the game 10-2. At the time, the Braves were 28-40, and good for last place in the National League. 98 days later, they would win the World Series. I'm Connor Grohl, and this is Slept on Sports, the podcast that takes interesting, lesser-known sports stories, stories you could say have been slept on, and brings them back into the light. Today, our story is the Miracle Braves, the 1914 Boston Braves team that during the season found themselves further under 500 than any other team in MLB history that would go on to win the World Series. The franchise currently known as the Atlanta Braves had been around since 1871, going by a variety of different names, including the Boston Red Stockings, Red Caps, Bean Eaters, Doves, and Rustlers, before eventually changing their name to Braves in 1912. As the Bean Eaters, the team won the 1892 World Series. However, the start to the 20th century was far from successful. In George Stallings' first season as manager in 1913, the team went just 69-82. and 82. However, it was their best record since 1902. For the 1914 season, the Braves brought in longtime Cubs second baseman Johnny Evers to serve as the team's captain. Evers had been with Chicago since the start of his MLB career in 1902, winning two World Series titles in 1907 and 1908, and even serving as the team's player-manager in 1913. Stallings and Evers formed a strong partnership to lead the Braves, but they were a weird duo. Stallings was a highly superstitious manager, with a bad temper and mixed success in his career. Evers was a hard worker, who would also go hard on his teammates. However, he also dealt with nervous breakdowns, and would frequently fight with umpires and get ejected. He also reportedly weighed no more than 130 pounds for his entire career. Other important players for the Braves would include the pitching duo of Bill James and Dick Rudolph, and future Hall of Fame shortstop Rabbit Moranville, who was just 22 at the time. The New York Giants entered the season having won three consecutive National League pennants. They were favorites to win their fourth in a row, and the Braves were not considered to be even remotely in the picture. The perennial losers found themselves with just 100-1 to odds to win the pennant in an eight-team National League before the year began. A month into the season, those odds would crater even lower, to 1,000-1. to You see, the Braves started the season 3-16, which already put them 10.5 games out of first place. My sources tell me this is not good. By early June, the Braves found themselves 12 and 28, 16 games under 500. To reiterate, a World Series winning team has never been further under 500 than this. After actually winning 10 of their next 12 games, the Braves found another rough patch, and by the 4th of July, were 26 and 40 and 15 games out of first place, a season high or low. The Braves won both games of a doubleheader against the Brooklyn Robins on July 6th, bringing them to 28-40. and 40. Then, it was time to head to Buffalo. The following day, the Braves lost 10-2 to the Buffalo Bisons, who were described by Johnny Evers as a soap company team. Forget the doubleheader win the day before. This was a new low point for the team. Stallings and Evers had never given up on the team despite their struggles earlier in the season. But now, the faith was finally being tested. As the Braves boarded their train, Stallings said, Big league ball players, you call yourselves, eh? You're not even grade A sandlotters. I'm ashamed of you all. But from that point on, something changed. 
Evers and the rest of the team said they would strive to do better. Stallings made a few necessary trades and shortened the pitching rotation down to three main guys. Bill James, Dick Rudolph, and Lefty Tyler. They were 13 and a half games out of first place, but there was still half a season to play. The Braves proceeded to win eight of their next 11 games. By the end of July 19th, they were out of last place in the National League, and they were out for good. That night, as the players left the field, they threw their caps and bats into the air and cheered like college boys. Then, the Braves' pitching became absolutely unstoppable. Over the next 14 games, the team allowed just 18 runs, going 12-2 and over the stretch. During this run, they played the Pittsburgh Pirates seven times. They shut out the Pittsburgh Pirates six times. Pitching is really what made the difference for the Boston Braves this season. For the year, they would end up batting just 251 as a team, but their pitching was exceptional. Bill James and Dick Rudolph would each win 26 games on the year. On August 1st, in a game in the middle of this pitching tear, the Boston Braves reached 500, 45 and 45. The Braves got special permission to play the game at Fenway Park, the two-year-old home of the American League's Boston Red Sox. The team usually played at South End Grounds, a ballpark with a capacity of roughly 10,000 fans. That was never really an issue before. The team wouldn't come remotely close to selling out. But now, all of a sudden, there was a huge amount of interest in the surging team and Fenway could hold more than three times as many fans. The Braves would play at Fenway again a week later, defeating the Cincinnati Reds to improve to 50 and 46. By September, Fenway had become the Braves' full-time home for the rest of the season, and until the new Braves field would open in August of the following year. The Braves would continue their remarkable, unforeseen surge throughout the month of August. At the beginning of the month, they were nine games out of first place. By the end of the month, they were just half a game out of the Giants, with a record of 63 and 51. But while the Giants would play basically 500 ball down the stretch, by this point, the Braves were basically on another planet. On September 2nd, the Braves would grab hold of first place for the first time. On September 8th, they retook first place for good. The Braves won 31 of their last 39 games, finishing with a record of 94 and 59. They won the National League pennant by 10 and a half games. In just over three months, the Braves went from 15 games out of first to pennant winners by double digits. If it seems like the second half of their season was just one hot stretch after another, that's because that's exactly what it was. After losing to the minor league Buffalo Bisons, the Braves finished the season 66-19. They lost back-to-back games only twice. If you extrapolate their winning percentage over that 85-game span to an entire 162-game season, They were playing at a 126 win pace. No team in MLB history has won more than 116 games in a 162 game season. Johnny Evers would win a predecessor to the modern MVP award, but work was far from over for the Braves. In the World Series, they would be facing the heavily favored Philadelphia Athletics who had gone 99-53 and to win the American League by eight and a half games. Connie Mack's team had won the World Series in 1910, 11, and 13, making them one of baseball's early dynasties. To make matters worse, Red Smith, the starting third baseman for the Braves, broke his leg on the last day of the regular season while sliding into second base. But manager Stallings had an almost inhuman confidence in his team, 
practically willing them to victory. Before the series began, he predicted that his Braves would sweep the A's in four games, something that had never happened in World Series history. Stallings fired up his players by staging a fake phone call with Connie Mack, where according to Stallings, Mack would not let the Braves use the A's Scheib Park to practice before the World Series. The Braves would instead end up practicing at the Baker Bowl, home of the Philadelphia Phillies. Stallings made it out like the A's didn't respect the Braves. He also told his players that the A's were overrated and that he wouldn't scout them, although his assistants secretly did. He also told his players to ignore the A's during games unless they were going to insult or harass them. The Braves won the first two games of the World Series in Philadelphia, and then after Game 2, Stallings told his team to take all their equipment because they won't be coming back to Philadelphia. After an extra innings win in Game 3, he doubled down on this, ordering the team road secretary to cancel their train reservations for Philadelphia. They wouldn't be needing them. They would be closing it out at home in four games. And of course, by home... We mean Fenway Park. But incredibly, that's exactly what happened, as the Boston Braves won Game 4 of the World Series 3-1, completing the sweep. An editorial in the Boston Globe the following day read, There was joy last night in Boston, the land of the free and the home of the Braves. Boston had gone from last place in the National League to a World Series championship. And while we've actually seen a few other teams in recent years do this, such as the Washington Nationals in Major League Baseball and the St. Louis Blues of the NHL, the Braves' accomplishment was perhaps the greatest, given that they needed to win the National League pennant, finishing first place in the regular season, to even make it to the World Series. Sadly, the Braves were mostly one-hit wonders. George Stallings remained the manager of the team through the 1920 season, and the Braves finished second and third in the National League in 1915 and 1916. But afterwards, they returned to their spot as bottom dwellers, with just one winning season in their next 16 years after 1916. The team wouldn't win another pennant until 1948, leaving a few years after that in 1953 to become the Milwaukee Braves, and then later in 1966 to become the Atlanta Braves. The franchise has won one World Series title in Milwaukee and in Atlanta. But for three months or so, the Braves did the unthinkable, putting together one of the greatest Rise from the Ashes stories perhaps in all of professional sports history. They truly were the Miracle Braves. This will be the last episode of Slept on Sports, at least for a while. As always, I've been Connor Grohl, thanks for listening, and stay sleeping.